thank you, thank you, Chase. I'm going to put a different hat on now and, and speak about, about global CIE. Global Comparative and International Education is a relatively young organization. We were able to hold the first forum just under two years ago go in Stockholm and uh, in person. We've had to depend upon filling in events, virtual events with the with uh, the KIE conference. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity to be able to uh, have a global CIE event as part of the uh, KIE conference. Uh, I sometimes, as I'm sure we all do, wonder why I'm involved in comparative and international education. Uh, it involves some very big questions of objectivity, subjectivity, insider observers, outsider observers, so on and so forth, that the big questions in comparative and international education, but I think they occur in a very concrete and direct form when you're looking at different cultures. Uh, as Professor Karenz has just reminded us, there's nothing quite so difficult to translate from English to German as the <laughs> word for education. So, so there are big questions arise. And so it's my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Michael Crossley, uh, I won't say an old friend, a long-standing friend who has devoted so much of his attention to exactly those very big questions that he's going to talk about today, about what the implications are for comparative and international education. So without more ado, I'll simply hand over to Michael uh, and let him get on with telling you what he has to say. Okay, Mark. Okay, thank you very much. Can you uh, see your David. screen now. Yeah. I hope we're sharing the screen. Are we sharing the screen? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Okay, lovely. Well, first of all, thank you for that kind introduction, David, uh, and the invitation to speak to everybody today. Um, as you can see from the title there, um, I was asked to speak on epistemological and methodological issues in comparative and international education. So I hope this is going to prove helpful for those of you out there. Um, let me just move to slide two and say, yeah, I'm speaking from the University of Bristol uh, and from my home in, in Bristol. We thought this event was going to be in Madrid some time ago um, because of COVID pandemic prevents us from meeting in person. Um, I know we've got a diverse audience. I know the Global CIE Forum supports new generations of scholars in our field, and therefore I'm doing this presentation in a way that I hope um, meets the interests of uh, all of those people in that mixed audience. Here are some aims for the presentation, especially in view of what I said in slide one. Um, these are the things that uh, I aim to do. I want to outline the key challenges and tensions that are currently being faced by CIE, paying particular attention to, as asked, as requested, the epistemological and methodological implications. Secondly, I want to set the analysis in, in, the, in terms of the current trends, and current trends and development in their wider historical, theoretical and cultural context. Thirdly, to interrogate the ways in which these challenges are being dealt with today in the light of the literature on international education policy transfer, and of course, in the light of my own related research in different contexts worldwide. Finally, I will identify a number of further concerns and priorities that I think demand critical attention for anybody working in the field of CIE into the future. The contemporary challenges and tensions, well, there are lots and this list could be huge, but I've tried to just focus upon what 
I've labeled here as the existential challenges too. Well, first of all, to the origins and history of our field. And that's as with many other fields and disciplines as well. Um, and associated with the current decolon decolonial debates and the global dominance of Western educational models and frameworks. Secondly, challenges to the concepts of international development and sustainable development, as perhaps implicated with modes of ongoing neocolonialism built into those processes or seen to be built into those processes. And thirdly, to look at the related implications for educational futures, it's a phrase used by UNESCO at the moment, um, educational development cooperation, environmental uncertainty, climate change, research modalities, and terms that other people have been using today, equity, identity. Also indigenous knowledges, and I think connecting a lot of the things I'm talking about today, epistemic justice. The structure. In engaging with these challenges, I'll divide the presentation up into four themes. I've just tried to package the things that I feel are important to say around these four bullet points. The first one is what I call a recurring theme of disciplinary reflexivity in comparative and international education. Secondly, connecting to work on international surveys of student achievement, what's been labeled as the power of PISA and the rise of the big data movement. And the third set of issues that I'll be raising connect to international agendas. There is a, um, an initiative called PISA for Development. So I'll connect briefly to that and to the concept of sustainability. The fourth and final section will pick up this concept of ways of knowing. And I'll be looking at different ways of knowing implications for research positioning and for epistemic justice. First theme then, a recurring theme of disciplinary reflexivity. This seems to me to be really important to say at this time when so many um, quite passionate debates are out there in the literature. So what I'm trying to say is current challenges and tensions being faced by our, by our field, by CIE, are generating critically important and very timely intellectual con contributions. This is a cutting edge, it's critical stuff that really does need doing. But while much needs to be done, this is not the first time um, that many of these issues have been identified and interrogated within the field of comparative and international education. Might not be the case in terms of educational research, research itself in a broader way or other fields perhaps, but I'm focusing upon comparative and international as a field. So disciplinary reflexivity is indeed a recurring field for us. And it's important to recognize how contemporary challenges and responses often build upon earlier phases of reimagining or reconceptualization. To give one example, and I'm, I could go way back, but there'd be too much to say. But if we go back to the millennium year of 2000, one benchmark when many fields, academic societies, peer reviewed journals, took stock of their development while looking to the future. And that was in times of what was seen then as intensified globalization. You could look at two linked millennium special issues of the journal Comparative Education, or we could look at the World Council of Comparative Education Society's Reflective Histories volume published in 2007, or in 2010, 2010, Marianne Larson published a, a, a book, a volume of collected essays calling for fresh thinking in the field of comparative education. There's uh, just a reminder of the two 
linked special issues of comparative education. The first one on the left hand side was an editorial board member's statement, but the second was a um, contributions, reflections, responses from different people um, engaged in the field at that time worldwide. That's the, the cover for the uh, World Council book, edited by Vandra Mason, Mark Bray, Bray and Maria Manzan. But anyone interested in looking at the different histories, the common interests, uncommon goals of different comparative and international societies worldwide could find that a useful resource to refer to. Here's a statement from the book by Marianne Larson. Comparative education researchers should engage in new and fresh thinking about what we study, the interpretive concepts, frameworks, theories, the influences and contexts that shape the work we do, the epistemic consequences of these broader changes for our field. My own work, if I look back um, at the turn of the century, sort of times, 1999, 2000, 2003, with good friend Keith Watson, um, argued for a fundamental reconceptualization, that was the term I prefer to use, of comparative and international dimensions of our field in ways that more effectively bridged what are seen by some as two different but related cultures and traditions in the combined field of comparative and international education. Now, at the heart of that were epistemological and methodological arguments. And they recognized the mutual benefits to be gained from a closer articulation between work on theory, policy, and practice within our field and how such reconceptualization could help to challenge Northern epistemic dominance. And what I saw at that time as the pervasive influence of positivistic assumptions and the persistence of uncritical education policy transfer, often with the support of leading development agencies from the North to the Global South. Now, from my own position, these were perspectives that were derived from personal interest, first of all, in the theoretical scholarship in comparative education, what some call the academic side of our combined field. But combined, this is the important point I'm making here, combined with in-depth engagement with the dilemmas of implementation, the actual practice, of innovation in, educa in educational policy in context then that included, well, the UK, Australia, but particularly formative for me in the context of Papua New Guinea. Anyone wants to know a little bit more about that background sort of contextual stuff, then this book that I published with Keith Watson in 2003 um, is perhaps a reference to have a look at. And the subtitle, which for me was really important, I think captures what we were trying to do at that time. It was globalization, context and difference, the sort of connections between. For present purposes, that's all I think I need to show at the moment because the big point I'm trying to make is that um, while new depths of critical reflection are really, really important today, Many constituencies involved in comparative education, comparative and international education, have faced repeated challenges and engaged in diverse forms of renewal in, in, and invention, reinvention over recent decades. It's not something new that's only happening now. And that for me is important because some of those prior developments, including challenging post-colonial analyses, or we could go back, I'm just thinking of earlier speakers today, we could go back to the influence of Paulo Ferreri's work and go further back into dependency theory um, literature within our, have been influential within the field of CIE. And they underpin and inform and inspire contemporary epistemological and methodological issues, challenges, and future directions 
that are the focus of the presentation now. So I'm now moving to my second theme, that sort of packaging together a, a, a number of uh, thoughts and arguments around international surveys of student achievement, the power of PISA, and the rise of the big data movement. Much of my own early methodological work really was concerned with a challenge, adding the, to the challenge to the dominance of quantitative research in the field of education. It does also included challenges to the positivistic trends at that time in comparative studies as well. And more directly, more positively, I, see, I guess, with the legitimation of qualitative case study research for the field of comparative education. And it was work I did with uh, another good friend, Graham Vullamy, in those years, uh, as you can see on that slide, that um, you could have a look at if you were wanting to find out what we were into then. If you look at the history of educational research in those 1970s, 80s, um, I guess we're talking English language world, but it does range beyond that. Um, but much was achieved. And I think there were real sort of creative times, decades, when di the diversification of educational and social science research cultures was quite dramatic. But if we look at the year 2000, the first year of the PISA studies, I would argue that again, globally, there was a resurgence of the prestige of quant quantitative surveys and statistical analysis in educational research. That sort of resurgence was well underway. My own analysis would say that that was rapidly followed by the arrival of new technologies, increased digitization, and the rise of, well, certainly uh, I've used this phrase, the big data movement. For me, and for comparative education, comparative and international education, I would argue this represented a major epistemological and methodological challenge or re-challenge, new challenge with new implications for the rebalancing of paradigms and frameworks for analysis, for their relative influence, especially in terms of policy issues and influence and analysis, especially in terms of the availability and nature of funding that was available for different types of research and for the potential to marginalize different types of university-based academics positioned as intellectual scholars or theorists, important times. In no way, um, I might be repeating something I'm gonna say later, but in no way am I trying to set up um, the paradigm wars that that phrase was used way back in the past to say that it's a case of either or quantitative or qualitative or statistical or, or not. So um, I'm trying to move well beyond that. But what I am saying is that the, the powerful voices, the language of power, as Fetterman um, said way back, um, so in some time um, is on the side of the more quantitative uh, approaches to research that do carry prestige, power and influence. It's the arguments I'm presenting are to try to keep a wide variety of methodological and epistemological approaches as valid and legitimate on the page, on the table. Going back to uh, the challenge, uh, Navoa and Yariv Marshall, very useful paper, very insightful paper. They were arguing in 2003, they were concerned that positivistic influences within comparative education were in danger of being used to legitimize policy positioning at the same time as they were threatening academic criticality. Other um, scholars, people we probably, many of us know, such as Alden Morris, argued at that time that th represented a new paradigm of comparative education. 
and its influential intermediate network of consultants backed up by large scale quantitative evidence as prioritized by policymakers and funders. Seller and Lingard, some of their work is very helpful for people grappling with this set of issues. They saw and see the OECD's PISA initiative as a new global mode of governance in education, highlighting how the top performing countries in PISA league tables, such as Singapore and Hong Kong, were becoming the new references societies that others felt compelled to copy. I was doing work at that time with one of my doctoral students based in Hong Kong, working for the British Council, Catherine Forestia. Um, and her research and our work together um, showed how Hong Kong's strong PISA results coming top of those league tables stimulated efforts by the Secretary of State for Education in England to, and that's not my word, plunder selected Asian practice. To cite Michael Gove's own words, he said this, I've been to Singapore and Hong Kong. And what is striking is that many of the lessons that apply there are lessons that we can apply here in England. He also said, I want my children who are in primary school at the moment to have the sort of curriculum that children in other countries have, which are doing better than our own. So how do we make sense of these things, these statements? There are certainly examples that demonstrate the power of PISA. They do demonstrate the rise of new reference societies in the East, the top performers in the global league tables. And they demonstrate efforts of policymakers to emulate top performers. Or if we want to dig deeper, and that's not the point of this presentation, but in that English case, you can read some of the material that Catherine has published. It was seen as a way of at least legitimating what in England were controversial, formalistic, I haven't put the word there, but cheaper reform proposals. Catherine's work was also helpful and it was ironic to see how, this is on the theoretical level, at the same time that England was looking at Hong Kong, looking for ways of borrowing, transferring, whatever words you find easier to use, um, formalistic modes of teaching and learning, um, that Hong Kong was doing the opposite. It was engaged in enough efforts to borrow elements of the English education system that would help them to become less didactic and more learner-centered. Times have changed since then. For present purposes, um, what I am saying here is, going back to the title of the session that I was invited to do, this adds further theoretical complexity, complexity to the existing conceptual and analytical frameworks that are in a very rich policy transfer literature in the field of comparative and international education. And this particular contribution demonstrates how policy borrowing, education policy borrowing, can be multidirectional. And not only that, can work both ways at the same time. The rise of the big data movement also generated a new area for critical policy transfer analysis. And I think this is one that deserves more attention, more careful attention. Much has been written promoting big data. And I'm not against trying to say that big data isn't great, it isn't useful, it can't be powerful, it can be all of those things. But many people have been actively promoting the benefits, the potential of being big data. But there is less critical analysis of the implications, particularly in, in terms of our international world of international development and cooperation. And very few people 
Well, this is back in 19, uh, sort of uh, 2014, when I was first publishing uh, a paper in comparative education in um, 2014 on this theme. Um, very few people were interrogating the power and dependency relations that the uncritical international transfer, not a policy and, and curriculum as such, but of big data findings, big data skills, big data technology, the problems that that could generate, especially in terms of transfer from the global north to the global south. In other words, we now have expensive big science research modalities that command great prestige, power, influence, with a potential, potent, good potential, okay, yeah, but also the potential to marginalize other more context sensitive forms of qualitative research. And I would say that also includes um, theoretical work, including post-colonial perspectives and also indigenous research methodologies, where I have much more to say later. Something very brief here on international agendas, PISA for development. The large scale international surveys of student achievement can also be seen to be influencing international development agendas, goals and targets. And the relatively new PISA for development initiative is one area which I think should raise further concerns for comparative researchers, especially those of the challenging simplistic education policy transfer. PISA for development that is trying to bring systems in the global south into the PISA network and to the PISA league tables with all that that might imply for the positive and also for the problematic. What I'm trying to say here though, is this has major epistemological and methodological implications for the international, uncritical international transfer of these high cost and they are positivistic research paradigms and modalities. With all that that might mean, for ongoing or future or different forms of research dependency and problems relating to epistemic justice. So I've put the next bullet point in bold. Maybe I'll let you read that rather than keep speaking to you. Timely imperatives. Yes, we must be more deeply reflexive as comparativists. At the same time, we must build upon early theoretical and conceptual contributions in advancing new intellectual frameworks, new critical histories and post-colonial analyses, analyses that recognize the contemporary decolonial challenge and value a diversity of cultures and ways of knowing. And that's where I'm going in the final section of this part of the presentation. With the title of the final fourth theme, Ways of Knowing, Research Positioning and Epistemic Justice. In 1990, a comparative paper by Van der Meesman was titled Ways of Knowing. So I felt it just useful to put that back on the table but it does demonstrate how comparative and international education has long grappled, I'm saying well before that as well, but long grappled with diversity in research and notions of epistemic justice. But it still is true that today, these are very key fundamental conceptual and methodological issues that underpin the contemporary de decolonization challenge. And they are issues that require ever deeper levels of critical reflexivity. Let me just look back at the University of Bristol in, in recent decades, um, at, right up to now. Within recent years, um, many of my colleagues working with um, uh, researchers in the Global South 
have centered on methodological issues relating to North-South partnerships, research positioning, Southern theory, epistemic justice, drawing on work of scholars as I've listed there, such as Lumba, Connell, De Santos, and others. There are many more. One example, and I believe my friend and colleague, Laura Arthur, might be in the audience at the moment. Um, with the support of BASE funding, the British Association for International and Comparative Education, we managed to pull together early career researchers and doctoral researchers and to revisit the change in nature of insider outsider positionings in ways that open up new liminal, you know, the third space, different ways, research spaces and non-binary. Again, I'm working hard here to try to dispel binary ways of thinking, but binary methodological frameworks for others carrying out in-depth fieldwork as independent researchers or in collaboration or co-construction with others. Um, another reference that I hope would be helpful for others and many, many uh, com comparativists do find themselves working as insiders or outsiders or what our book is really trying to say is you often find you're a bit of all of these and it's changing over time in our rapidly interconnected, interconnected world. More recently, a series of three online webinars have been combined by um, the Centre for Comparative and International Research in Education in Bristol, in collaboration with UNESCO on the theme of decolonizing education for sustainable futures. Um, this was uh, Leon Tickley's, Professor Leon Tickley's uh, UNESCO Chair Seminar Series uh, that pulled together the uh, three events, um, which itself has led to the publication of a, a report that I'll mention in a second. The, the global initiative established by UNESCO in 2019 is trying to reimagine how knowledge and learning can shape the future of humanity and the planet into the future. And I would say, yep, it's very timely um, for those calling for a more inclusive and culturally diverse development frameworks. Um, this sort of thinking connects well with the lecture that we've uh, previously had by Professor uh, Rolf uh, Constance uh, earlier this evening. Here's um, a statement that's a quote taken from the report, the synthesis report from those three webinars, which is now available um, online uh, through the UNESCO chair um, website or the University of Bristol website. Certainly it's uh, presenting a major challenge here, major challenges and challenges for UNESCO, given that this is a product of a, um, a collaborative event. Much of the knowledge, values and skills expected to be learned in formal education systems have been Eurocentric in nature. I'll let you read on. calling for education to be de decolonized and for diverse knowledge systems to be the basis for realizing equitable and sustainable futures. Beyond that, um, advancing decolonization analyses, I would argue that, yep, and more robust work also needs to be done to extend and apply decolonial analyses in ways that do the following. Avoid the emergence of new dualistic tendencies that are historically nuanced and rigorous, perhaps deeper in critical reflexivity. Do more to explore differences within and across the CIE research constituencies worldwide and that are more truly global in nature and scope. And it's that last phrase that leads me into my concluding um, uh, set of arguments, where I want to highlight exciting work being carried out within what UNESCO classify as small island developing states. 
my own experience at the University of Papua New Guinea throughout the 1980s sort of was formative in many ways. And it led to the development when I moved to Bristol of the Specialist Education in Small States Research Group and to ongoing work with colleagues and friends in small island developing states worldwide, including as adjunct professor at the University of the South Pacific. The global network was established in 1994, with now well over 100 members worldwide, including from all three major groupings of small states in the Pacific, the Indian Ocean and the Caribbean. And the website referenced there, if anybody wants to find out more about the work we're doing together. I know some of um, our colleagues from um, Oceania, from the Pacific, are with us today. So hello to them. And really this section is inspired by my work with and uh, uh, those good friends. Tongan writer and anthrop anthropologist Epili Hawofa, um, who categorizes Pacific islands you can see the decolonial stuff coming in immediately as large ocean states or as Oceania's Sea of Islands made seminal contributions to decolonization uh, literature some decades ago. And others working in this tradition have long challenged the dominance of Western development discourses and epistemologies and their influence upon education in the Pacific. Kanai Helu Tarban, um, Tongan poet um, and professor of, of education at the University of the South Pacific. Her work um, captured this very early on and has inspired other, other generations. And while this literature is little known beyond the region, I'm arguing here that it has much to offer the international community. And it's inspired new generations of Pacific researchers to ground their work in traditions from their own contexts exhibiting deep respect for oceanic cultures, values, and, quote, relational space. Francis Coya, Vaca Alta, um, Rosiana Lager, two names there. For me, this is important scholarship for the wider international comparative community, and especially for those engaging with decolonial issues and their implications across the social sciences and humanities. Another colleague in the Pacific, Sa'ula, who's the director of the USP, University of the South Pacific Institute of Education based in Tonga, argues that this, she's talking particularly to the international comparative and international community. The current conversation, is it just for outsiders? If the voice of insiders are included more strongly in conversations about comparative and international education research, what would this do for research approaches, for methodology, for knowledge generated? Important. To bring things in focus with you know, the, the big challenges of our, our whole globe, something that shows that we are all interconnected to do with environmental uncertainty and climate change. Rosiana Lagi, um, her work has been looking at environmental uncertainty and work on indigenous knowledge and local understandings of climate change in the Pacific. This offers a lot of potential for realistic insights and policy learning, policy learning for a wider international community and theoretical learning for a wider international community um, from and for other small island developing states living at the sharp end. And this is something we've been working around with colleagues here in Bristol and in small states in our our um, uh, education in small states research group for many years, living at the sharp end of environmental in uncertainty. And that's Rosie, who is um, at the University of the South Pacific School of Education. 
So small island developing states are some of the most vulnerable contexts experiencing the impact of sea level rise in the world, with, for example, Tuvalu in the Pacific and the Maldives in the Indian Ocean facing national inundation with a rise of just one meter in sea level, perhaps the height of the desk I'm sitting at now. But SIDS are also notably resilient. They've achieved a great deal and their experience is invaluable for the international community. So this points to what I believe is significant and timely potential for comparative studies of the educational implications of climate change to learn from indigenous knowledge and from locally grounded perspectives through detailed homegrown qualitative research. I'm getting towards my conclusion and I think it's exactly on time, but um, I'd like to leave the last word on SIDS rather than it being from me to Dame Paulette Louise, um, former Governor General of St. Lucia, 1997 to 2018, 20 years as head of state, longest serving female head of state in the Commonwealth, I believe. And she was also a founder member of our Education in Small States Research Group. Um, at a, uh, a speech uh, carried out in uh, Labory, which is where she was born, in a little village in St. Lucia in the Caribbean. Um, she said, if culture shapes what we mean by development, we need to have a firm understanding of the way of life by which we want to be defined. We, it's her voice need to agree on the social order that we need to construct and share with each other. This for me is very resonant of many of the arguments presented by my Pacific colleagues and friends. We need to take up the challenge of reclaiming our own voices, of finding out who we are, the challenge of adapting these voices to present day realities, the challenge of nurturing the cultural ethos that will infuse our sustainable development agenda. Now, Perlet is connecting and keen for um, her nation and Caribbean states to connect with the international community in terms of international development processes and so on. But she's saying more on their terms, through their eyes, in tune with their values, um, aspirations, etc. So I think I'm concluding my presentation bit of the session. I think I've one or two more slides. Now there's one slide here, but I did say I would try to just point to some new issues that I really think need further uh, renewed attention, particularly relating to publication, access, epistemic justice in our field and beyond our field. And maybe our field can be instructive to other fields, maybe we should be at the head of the curve. Um, critical issues concerning the internationalization of academic publishing connects to what we've just been saying. This relates to the importance of new directions, frameworks and platforms to provide greater support for researchers, perspectives and publications located in and from the global south to contribute to the international discourse, further internationalizing higher education and the related academic literature. Raphael Mitchell's work with his colleagues um, here in Bristol and around the globe, um, particularly valuable, do have a look at some of that work. We're trying at, with Bristol University Press as well um, to make some contributions is, in this way. There's a hot link there for anybody that could follow it. So uh, um, if this is made available um, to our new book series in the Bristol Studies called Bristol Studies in Comparative and International Education, where we're trying to do many of the things in the paragraph above. However, global citation data, league tables and digital systems certainly reinforce the position, status and profits of large international publishing houses, 
often at the expense of epistemic justice, affordable access, and the emergence of more locally produced arguments, journals, and books. How our field can deal with such imbalances in more contextually sensitive and ethical ways remains a further priority for attention. Quick conclusions. First paragraph, reiterating the challenges that I began this session with. The uncertainties generated by climate change in what we hope will be a post-hope, post-COVID, let's hope it is, world. Presentations focused on related theoretical, epistemological and methodological issues. Yeah, importantly, arguing that while some of these challenges are new and generated by our rapidly changing and digitized world, it's important to recognize how others represent further iterations and intensifications of concerns and responses that informed earlier phases of critical reflection within our field. So my conclusions, maybe for the roundtable debate, sort of ideas, thoughts, I'm calling for CIE to pursue increased self-reflexivity from a diversity of cultural, epistemological and methodological positions, while challenging uncritical pragmatic and policy transfer and engaging with fundamental tensions. This is an important phrase in less dualistic ways, more historically nuanced ways, more ethically diverse and contextually sensitive ways. I think that should be on time. Thank you to everybody who may be there. I hope this is helpful. And I thank everyone and look forward to our roundtable discussion. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank, thank you. <clears throat> so much for a very exciting presentation and it would be surprising if I didn't find a huge amount to agree with in what you've had to say. Uh, I mean to, to take the simplest uh, the, the question of Pisa is clearly ridiculous on very many different levels that there uh, that, that we could have a score. We could, we could talk about scientific ability and uh, mathematical ability. But the presence of a number helps us to forget that it's simply ridiculous to think that a country could have mathematical ability. Uh, but I think where I slightly diverge from you you and to, to concentrate on what's different is to me the presence of the number help, helps us to make the mistake but the real mistake is one of reification of believing that categories are solid that they represent something uh, and it seems to me that the great benefit of comparative and international education is that it challenges the solidity of those categories and of the, those uh, words that we apply to categories. But my sense is that it's not the number that promotes reification. It might help, but it doesn't promote the reification. We can also get reification around words. Uh, we can believe there is something called Africa. We can believe there's something called Europe. That is, doesn't need any longer to be questioned. And particularly, uh, a range of words seem to be coming almost beyond question, beyond interrogation, global north, global south, race, gender, possibly even epistemic justice. And binary conflict over views. That is it becoming harder to resist the reification, which for me, and I guess for you, I think for you also, is one of the major raison d'etres 
of comparative and international education? Are we being forced into a position where we're having to see our categories politicized and therefore making it harder for us to do the abstract uh, scientific interrogation of those concepts that are being used in our field. But I, I found the, the presentation thoroughly stimulating and if I questions because I think it's an important question that you've pointed us towards. So thank you very much indeed. Um, Michael, I wanted to just share with you two things that I thought were just absolutely fantastic that I would like to share with you and um, the audience. And the, uh, the very fact that you actually used your students uh, to, and their, and their work has um, kind of helped raise the importance of the underutilization of the knowledge of our students when we, when we actually grapple with such issues as epistemology and methodology. And the other one was uh, Tommen. Uh, I've met uh, Professor Tommen and I found her work quite interesting because uh, she used poetry uh, to help um, send a message out. And um, it actually helped raise my level of consciousness of how we actually um, interpret, um, internalize, and utilize the knowledge that we share and, and, and learn from. So I wanted to thank you for introducing those two individuals, for example. But the, um, the new question I have is, getting back to Vandra Maisman's um, ways of knowing. And I wanna share this only from the vantage point of the fact that um, many of us in comparative and international education are transferring the scepter from <laughs> um, uh, the older guard to the new guard. And the new guard is having to contend with two things that I think are kind of fundamental uh, that are different from what we've learned over the course of the history of comparative and international education. The first is the fact that um, machine learning has finally surpassed the brain. And the threshold was apparently established, I think, probably one to two years ago, where um, artificial intelligence was starting to overtake um, the human brain. And so humanizing the educational experience is a question. The second one is in relation to uh, educational sustainability. And it's, it's in relation to the fact that um, in the UK just today, there's been a world co uh, conference on um, the world um, uh, living way beyond its means. And so uh, to try and bring this together with Rolf's uh, presentation on schooling, um, how do you, uh, how can you guide or advise a young comparativists and young educators in dealing with these two very new issues that we're having to confront? Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Michael, for your presentation. David began his report by saying, it was exciting and I would like to agree with him. But for me, it's also very frightening because I just realized that after your presentation, we know nothing at all. 
you know, I mean, we know so little. There's so much yet to be learned. And the challenges that comes from um, comparative and international education, they are varied and they are many, and they can be interpreted in so many different aspects, not just the epistemological and methodological implications, but those two within themselves, they just stretch and stretch and stretch. And when we look at the ways of knowing, yes, we need that. But for me, and I, I guess for many others, how do we differentiate between the ways of knowing and the knowledge itself? And, it's, and it takes us into deeper or wider terrain where it takes us into ways of feeling, ways of perceiving the many perceptions that we have, ways of thinking that has to do with our intellectual and cognitive abilities and ways of doing, ways of relating, you know, ways of empowering and ways of being empowered. So I, I, I really, I was so engrossed in the presentation because and, and at the same time, scared because I'm saying we know nothing at all. I appreciate your, your reference to Marianne Larson, her fresh thinking. I, I really like that. And again, it, it tells me from then until now, we have fresher thinking. And as situation evolves around the world on a global scale, it is so clear that how fresh is the fresh thinking. We always have to be on our feet. So it's like an avalanche of fresh thinking at every level, mm -hmm. at, at every turn. So it, it is so good that you introduce Marian's um, way. And you made mention of how the boring educational and policy boring that goes on between countries. And I smiled because while we are looking at Hong Kong and Singapore, Hong Kong and Singapore, and I said we in terms of the West in England, are looking at, at us. But then it raises that question, where do we look for better? It reminds me of a, con a CE conference in Hong Kong I think you were present at that conference, um, Professor Michael, a CE conference at, in Hong Kong where the presenter from South Korea was talking about how South Korea built its education system after the, the Korean War and what they used. And I remember that particular conference. There were people from the UK saying, wow, that is what we need to do because they were paying special attention to the foundation, that, that's the, the pre-primary level and the primary level rather than university level. And, and everybody thought that was quite good. So where do we look? Where do we borrow from? And who do we borrow from? And when we look too at small states, you introduced the small states um, into the discussion. Is it because they are small states that we are not borrowing from them? Because they too have quite a lot that we can learn from. And I remember um, a few years back at a, 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 a conference at the Commonwealth Secretariat in Marlborough, where we, we had a, it was a small states conference and my paper was entitled Small Within Small because there are certain indicators of what represents small states. There are certain indicators. And I had to challenge those indicators because they're small and they is small. So it's good that you mentioned St. Lucia as a small state. But when you think of like Anguilla and St. Martin and Montserrat, they're even smaller. So the issues get wider and wider and wider. Uh, and in terms of the methodological framework, um, that too is changing. Because in terms from a qualitative perspective, for example, there, there are so many ways now that you can analyze 
or collect data other than the binary way that we are accustomed to. There's so many ways. And the speaker, Brian, I think, who mentioned a poem was used. And when we think of people like Butler Kisler, Linda, who writes about how do you use poetry and photography and paint art and painting, how do you use them to represent your research and how, how do you analyze them? It takes us into another level. So you understand why I said this is so frightening because the more we learn, the less we know. And uh, before I end, I would like to also make reference to sustainability. Um, it's the big thing. Everybody, I mean, without it, we would be. We need to sustain ourselves. And within that sustainability, you introduce the north-south divide, which, of course, is oh, it's such a big discussion within itself. So um, from, from the Little South, um, Henry 2012, from the University of the West Indies, he introduced what we call an interna internationalization spirit. That's what we, we need to cultivate in order to help with sustainability. And you went on to talk about indigenous epistemologies. And again, I support that we need to look at that. It is so very important. And George and Lewis, 2011, again from the University of the West Indies, they were the ones who introduced the, the term a third space. We need a third space. And that third, it's within that third space that we are going to look at indigenous knowledges. So, there, you have given me a whole lot to think about us. You have given us a whole lot to think about. And you now you can see why it's frightening because the more we hear, we realize the less we know. But it was really a very, very good presentation that I benefited from. And it has reawakened in me all those conferences I had on small states, on sustainability, on, in, on indigenous knowledges and stuff like that and it's telling me there's a lot more work to do so the whole cie concept the way i see it fitting in the, on the basis of your presentation it fits very well into the vuca concept and i know it is used mostly in a business sense but it was coined by Benis and Malus in 1987. And they used it when they were thinking of the different types of leaders. And VUCA is volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And although it's used a lot in the business world, for CIE, it's right there. We cannot ignore it. So, we have much more to look at and thanks for your enlightening, inspiring presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, James. I'll respond in reverse order if that's okay. Yes. Um, one reason because I can remember then what uh, Gertrude has just been saying and two, to make sure we stop her being frightened as quickly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't answer everything that you've asked questions about, Gertrude, but one big sort of note I made here, um, you, you were you know, saying there's so much, so many issues and who then can we borrow from? I think you used the word borrowing. Well, throughout almost everything I've been saying is uh, let's get rid of the borrowing uh, uh, mentality in a way. Yes, learn comparative, yeah and learning from the international experience or the other small states experience or the smaller small states experience. But it's a process of us being the active part and learning from rather than looking on like on the shelf to find a way through. I guess I've been saying things like that. But then I'm really pleased that you're responding to the uh, uh, the small state sort of literature stuff. And I think we still have our friends from the Pacific stuff. Um, for me, I think the more the literatures that have developed in the um, Caribbean, 
are shared with those in the Pacific, are shared with those that are coming from the Indian Ocean. And we've got colleagues as well from Maldives here with us today too. Um, similar insights, but not the same experience, not the same context, um, but similar inspirations perhaps, um, and indigenous knowledges to share across small states, but particularly with the international community that I would like to see listening more rather than, you know, telling uh, new imperialisms of, of foreign aid and so on. Um, and that's why I get particularly worried about it in terms of the big research modalities. It is nothing to do with me being against, um, uh, you know, what, for or against statistical techniques or statistical data, but you just think of that word data, it, it is a bit fetishized these days, you know, data is good, data is our solution, data is our answer in certain territories. Well, within our comparative and international communities, research communities, we've got this wealth of, of experience, truly international, but I'm arguing for it to be even more international. Let's let the small state voices into that debate more strongly as Saula wishes to see, as Francis Coy of Vakuatu would like to see, as Konai Tarman argued long, long ago. Um, so I think that's probably enough around those things, but with confidence, and I'm, I'm really pleased that you found it sort of uh, stimulating maybe is the only word I can say there, Gertrude, and uh, connect with, uh, yeah, um, connect with all those different voices in a diverse way. And going backwards then through Brian, students and their work, vital part of, well, for me, oh, and the Kanai stuff as a poet. Yeah, again, for me, um, well, I've done work with other others of my students. Keith Holmes is one who now works within UNESCO, but we were looking at the work of the poets in the Caribbean as, as data, <laughs> as, as other forms of research evidence. And um, the arguments we were pursuing there were, well, this is Keith's work, Keith right at the front as my doctoral student, arguing that um, uh, great insights could come from looking at the Calypso um, stories. Um, there's the politics of the Caribbean, a source of data, but no one would call it data or research evidence or, and so on. Another form of diversity that takes us into the arts, which for me relates us back to all the work that Francis is doing as an artist in the Pacific and, and, and others. Um, and therefore students, yeah, I've now had exactly 50 doctoral students graduate, you know, go all the way through to successful completion, but they've been at the heart of moving the sort of stuff I've been doing in the field with me forward. So, you know, absolutely crucial. And therefore our Bristol University Press book series and Bristol University Press are being so good with being on the same page, literally, with us on that. We've got if you if you find if you look on their website, find our Bristol Studies in Comparative and International Education flyers. We're saying we're prioritizing publishing work from the global south, wherever that might be. You know, none of us like these labels, but also supporting young and early young researchers, doctoral researchers, and early career researchers to get their work out quickly into the international literature. So, um, Brian, maybe that's some answers to your points that you raised. And back to David, statistics, the importance of them. Um, I, I think what I'm saying is comparativists were so well placed because we have this wonderful experience of being able to connect with different parts of the world, wherever we might be from. We might be Professor Nkobi Pansiri working in Botswana, but you know he's connecting to a, a global world as, just as much as I am from Bristol. Um, that we have that, that sort of truly global experience that I think helps us challenge the positivism that really can be hidden within Western science that remains dominant. And 
that's why I sort of have my concerns about the big data movement and so on. Not to say that that stuff is incredibly powerful in the right place at the right time, but it also has the downsides that I think we've just got to explore. So it's not an either or again, it's looking for um, a non-dualistic sort of way of tackling this. But at the moment, I feel the voices um, of those that are challenging the power and prestige of that form of research, evidence and research need a helping hand. I think I've covered everybody in one way or another there, but there might be others now who want space to speak. Thank you very much. My name is Rehabiam Katengela Awala. Uh, I'm from Namibia. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Michael Crossley uh, for a very excellent presentation. Um, you talk about learner-centered ed education which I found it very, very interesting and very useful. Uh, the global South in Africa uh, in general, and Namibia in particular, where I'm from, education has been teacher-centered for a long time instead of learner-centered. The, the learners needs to be involved uh, in their education, as you have indicated. I was impressed when I did my postdoctoral research at the University of London in UK, the professors were encouraging us to ask questions, um, but in Southwest Africa, where I did my study, uh, before independent of the Republic of Namibia, we were discouraged to ask questions because when you ask questions too much, you were regarded as like the troublemakers. I, I would like also here to thank Professor Basiri for uh, inviting us to participate in this excellent presentation. Once again, thank you, Professor Crossley. Everybody, uh, thank you very much for um, giving me the opportunity to participate in this seminar. And I don't know, David and uh, Michael, whether you were aware, but uh, you were in very good company in the virtual space today. You were competing for attention with Boris Johnson, uh, <laughs> who was closing the Global Education Summit at five o'clock. So um, you're in very, very good company, I think. Um, Michael, I wanted to build a little bit from what you said about the contemporary decolonization debates, about the need to avoid new binaries and the need for historically nuanced and rigorous studies of education and development. And I wanted to know whether you felt that there might be space within our very broad field of CIE for studies of decolonization, education and sustainable development in those small countries that were colonized before the 19th century wave of European colonization. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh Thank you, Angela. Um, yeah, pass whatever I say on to Boris then, Angela, if you're in touch. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, well, I wasn't sure what question you were going to come out with when you started talking about my comments about new binaries and um, so on with, in, and the decolonization debate. Um, but first, my first response to your reflections is that I think there's a huge amount of space to open up in terms of the way the decolonization debate is going within our field of comparative in international education. At the moment, I 
feel there's really exciting stuff happening, but there aren't enough spaces and enough critical reflection, even within the work that's been done within our field. So given that some of my theme, big themes today was challenging binaries wherever they might appear, um, and also trying to bring a sense of history more strongly into the contemporary analysis. You know, the point that it's not the first time we've been needed to be very critically self-reflective. And actually, sometimes the stuff that's going on now needs to connect to stuff that went on before. And even my big point about Epili Haofa's uh, contribution to decolonization debates in the South Pacific, his first publications are around 1993 and sort of in our Western literature and even our passions to argue about decolonization at the moment, those are not recognized and missed and, and there's great wealth of insights there. And hence, I think the Pacific literature is particularly strong. But similarly, as Gertrude was saying, also huge um, traditions, strong traditions and critical theoretical positions coming from the Caribbean as well. Um, now, um, your, your later bit, space to open it up into, um, what was your phrase? How did you describe those, those categories? Um, well, I spoke about the need to avoid new bin binaries, the need for historically nuanced and rigorous studies. Um, so but the then opening I was... of space in. Okay, so I said, is there, do you think there's space within CIE for studies of decolonization, education and sustainable development in those small countries that were colonized before the 19th century wave of European colonization? I mean, my point is that there have been throughout history, there have been many waves of colonization coming from every direction. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering whether you feel we should go way back in history yeah, yeah. or whether we should confine our historical analysis to what's happened in the 20th and 21st century. No, I just wanted to sort of open it up properly for everyone else listening. Yes is my answer to your question, that specific question. But my broader answer is and yes to opening up the debate into other forms of colonization that our globe has experienced over multiple um, eons of time in, in different, you know, in, in the Far East or in, in, in Latin America and, and back in historic time. And I think that's a what not only is it important to do that, but it's a way of making the debate today a healthier debate, I think, as well. Thank you. Um, and now going back to RK um, from Namibia. Good to hear you're there. I was told that one of my former students, Colin Chitimera, if I got his surname right, who's in Namibia, would be here today. But I don't know if he is here, but I'm glad you are. Um, and uh, I think the, the notes I made, you were talking about teacher centered sort of modes of teaching and learning and then more learner-centered approaches to teaching and learning. My sort of comment there is relating to your experience and what you were searching around is the literature I find most helpful is that again is trying to avoid a binary of setting traditional forms of teaching and learning that might be more didactic against learner-centered pedagogy as if it's one or the other. And I, you know, if I'm overly simplistically critical of international development agendas, they've often been promoting learner centeredness wherever, somewhat context free, without enough nuancing. For me, the sort of space between, you know, the, the, that it might not be one or the other, that, that there are strengths and limitations of both of those extremes of pedagogy that that could be beneficial depending on the context. And people like uh, Angeline Barrett at uh, Bristol have written on, on that sort of theme. Um, more controversially work by Gerard Guthrie sort of hits lots of tricky buttons around that stuff, but is still revealing. 
Um, uh, so I would say, think of it in, in three ways at least, and more ways than just the two. And it might just be that in certain contexts, some um, traditional, in inverted commas, approaches to pedagogy might fit, but that doesn't mean to say that's the whole menu and learner-centered pedagogy might be appropriate. And again, that might not be the whole menu and the, the whole answer, depending where you are and what period mm -hmm. of time. Right. Thank you, thank you, um, Chair, and thank you, Prof. Uh, Crossley, for a very inspiring um, presentation. I'm always inspired to um, with your your presentations, um, perhaps because you have been my uh, supervisor and mentor in the academia. Um, but most importantly, Prof, what what I've always liked about your work is the uh, philosophy of context matter. Uh, you have inspired me now to think uh, very critically on the questions of one size fit all. Because um, by and large, from the global south, we work harder to try to copy what the global north is doing. Uh, we have pay little attention to comparative education. We tend to want to do uh, what uh, the Global North is doing. And I've not seen us succeeding uh, because we can catch up, because we want to, we fall to a trap of the one size fits all, you know, because um, our policy, as we talk of policy transfer, we have, what has been transferred to us, um, has made us to believe we, we are the same. Take us, for instance, in Africa, Namibia is, is, is its own context, South Africa is its own context, Zambia is its own context. You know, it's, it's, it's just that thing. It's just the make of the continent Africa. But when we, and within one country, you have many cultures. Take Botswana, for example. You have different ethnic uh, groups, different linguistic setups, they have different cultures, and we policies that we've uh, used the word borrowed, uh, they make us look like we are one. And we are, we are never successful in what, in our education system and imperative. There are always problems, you know, in the system. Uh, some people feel marginalized. There's a problem of identity crisis, uh, linguistic dislocation, uh, you know, but, but this is not the issue. The issue that I want you perhaps to uh, look at and also advise us uh, with your again um, language of reclaiming, you know, identities, reclaiming uh, originality, especially for us in the global south. Um, would you think that um, when we talk comparative education and school leadership, would you suggest that we must also now try to reclaim our purpose and understanding of school leadership in as far as our cultures are concerned? And, and, and understand there, you know, how we should, for instance, run our school systems in a manner that reflect who we are, uh, where the kind of you know, identities that uh, make us as Africans and African region. Would you, in terms of comparative education, uh, you know, guide us to look at something uh, along those lines? Thank you. Hey, thanks, Nkobe. It's nice to hear your voice. And uh, uh, I'm glad that sort of the, the little mantra of context matters sort of helps you to work sort of different thoughts out because it, it's not, I don't say, you know, if anyone who's read the work, the extra words I say about context matters, no, it, it's more subtle than that sort of simple label because I mean it in terms of intellectual context, not just geographical context. It, it could mean sort of historical context. It, it could mean sort of an epistemological 
mindset or, and context. It's got those multiple, multiple ways of being able to use it. Um, and while it, it sounds simple, and in fact, some people will say, well, you've said that many times, um, thing is in terms of policy issues and, and policy implementation and international aid work, I, I still feel it's underrepresented. So it's still worth re-saying. Um, if nobody's listening, then you have to say it again, it's, you know, it can be said. Um, now, particularly for your, because I know you're sort of especially interested in leadership and school leadership in, in Botswana in particular, but also throughout Africa. Yeah, the context sort of argument works in multiple ways. I'd say, yes, apply it in the theoretical critique too. Um, the best answer I've got that's more on focus for you is that I can remember working with colleagues in different African contexts and they were trying to deal with what literature could they use for university teaching about school leadership and it was all western literature and all I was learning while I was there you know as a qualitative person soaking up the local view and way things operated was that leadership was seen in a very different way in Botswana for instance than it is in the UK and a good leader would have different characteristics in Botswana maybe or somewhere else uh, in different African contexts to, to that that is sort of characterized in models in the Western theoretical literature. So I think if you're doing further research and writing around school leadership in the context of Botswana, gosh, there must be huge opportunities to challenge the still uncritical transfer, but not just of policies, but of theoretical literatures and models that, that people probably have to read in an African university program on school leadership when really what is needed is well-grounded, contextually and culturally sensitive um, work that connects with leadership challenges and possibilities and skills within Botswana itself. I won't say any more because it'll just muddy the water, but that sort of thing is what I, I, how I'd respond a little bit for you. Uh, I, whilst I was listening to you, so I, it was very interesting, but um, um, as it was previously mentioned, the GPE met today for its major uh, replenishment. Now, you know, this is an event that may figure in some people's universes, but not in others. But the simple truth is that there were probably about uh, 15 African ministers or their deputies at that meeting, and they presented a GPE, Global Partnership of Education, kind of view of the world, an agency view of the world, which doesn't map at all, I would say, onto the sort of things that CIE has, seems to preoccupy itself with. So there was no kind of mention of uh, neocolonialism, no mention of post-colonialism. Um, there was a lot of uh, cross-references one way or another, though, to research programs, uh, some of which I'm sure you're familiar with. The stuff that's being produced by KICS, which is the GPE's $50 million program to do research, um, which comes up with all sorts of policy recommendations. The GIA, the Global Advisory Group, that DFID and the World Bank have produced. RISE, um, these groups are the ones which are defining the global agenda, or at least the global agenda that these people talk about. And of course, they're alongside them, and you could see them in the GPE, uh, various other interest groups, most obviously private sector companies for profit and so-called not for profit, um, and philanthropists, the billionaires, are all talking a language, none of which seems to map onto the concerns of CIE. Now, I think it should, you know, both, both parties would benefit if they could actually understand there's something more than the development agenda of the agencies uh, and their supporters. But I wonder, you know, how, how that might come about, because uh, it seems to me rather important, because 
the way in which research is being used by the agencies is very selective and very narrow. It's uh, overly dominated by RCTs. And of course, it's often not evidence-based policy, but policy-based evidence, if you know what I mean. Mm. So I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. I mean, I think it's really important, both for the field and for the next, next generation of graduate students, um, that they see the difference between that transnational world of fast talking, big money, and uh, mm. lots of uh, apparent influence. And a counterpoint, of course, is the slow burn of development, which is that the truth, generally speaking, will be out. It's just a question of the time scale. Yeah, I think it's a good discussion point, Keith. Um, I'm not even going to give one answer to that in a way. It, I'll join the discussion with you. I, I agree, first of all, I think that is vital. Um, you know, I, I hate to sort of keep connecting to some of the phrases I've used for a long time, but my argument about bridging cultures and tradition and seeing comparative in international research actually hit, tried to capture that so many decades ago when I first sort of wrote that phrase, when I was trying to bridge the worlds of the comparative in academic researchers with the international education community that at that time would be seen as those people involved in international development work and the sort of research that you have just been pointing to that dominates the uh, GPE sort of meetings and debates. So I think it it's very much the old way of that world still working it's not that it ever went away and it's now back in its new disguises and new shapes and new forms and it's important that that bridging work is done so for me people that can help to translate and bridge between those divides are vitally important today I'd, i've actually been looking at some of that sort of literature on the new research models and and so on and it it is unless you're connected in that language and in that world it's somewhat impenetrable and it certainly would be to people out there in the global world that often this stuff is it claiming to be finding appropriate answers and solutions for it i'm giving you a sort of complicated answer that i hope isn't modeled for our wider audience but I totally agree. Is in like another culture, another language, another type of research, not too far removed from my critique of the big data movement, because I'm not in in my phrases that I've used when I've written on that, I've tried to distance it from paradigm differences to say whole modalities of research. And I think that is almost what you're talking about there, whole languages and modalities of research that don't sound anything like what I've been talking about, or certainly what a lot of the comparative and international research community talk about. And particularly if you push it into the divide of the comparativists who see themselves as, uh, as preserving academic comparative education and actually have a tendency not to want to even bridge, like I argue in the first place. And I'm nowhere near doing the job that you're saying needs to be done. I don't know if that's coherent enough for for you and for everyone else, but I think this is a really important conversation and a big issue. I think it's really important because um, it's really important to have a community of people who are free of conflicts of interest, or at least we hope they are, Yeah. who, who can, as I used to say, speak truth to power. Yeah. But it's becoming, I think, more and more difficult um, to see how that works in terms of whether power is listening to truth. Yeah. Um, and if nobody's telling the truth, I mean, in, in, in some sort of uh, semi-literal sense, then yeah. of course there's nothing, there's nothing to 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 uh, push back against. I think it's uh, extremely worrying that we have uh, a, a, an over concern for the messaging. If I want to put it in a different language, I would say that the 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 narrative is beginning to dominate the reality. Yeah, you know, that the story becomes more important than whether it's true or not. 
Yeah. It's just whether it's a good story, and that any good story uh, has currency. This is very dangerous. And I think what worries me, I, I'm still on the same page with you here, is I feel a widening of the divide between the theoretical comparativists and the people engaged in policy and the real world of practice of international development that you're trying to talk about here. We've both been involved in, in UCFIAT for decades, and UCFIAT was an effort to sort of bridge some of those divides and make the, lang the, the different constituencies talk to each other and hear each other and stuff like that. But I looked at the UCFIAT program that just came out very recently. This is a conference program for everyone else that's listening that's going to be in September. Um, and I'm not sure I can see enough of material that is actually talking past the, you know, the papers on this or that, but not that sort of connect, which I think is still the same issue you're talking about. Anyway, for the wider audience, I don't want to sort of muddle the thoughts, but I agree. Uh, I hope that's visible within the threads of things I've tried to say today, though, you know, I've been speaking more to a, as a, an academic, I guess, in the way I've spoken today. Just wanted to reassure Michael that I'm still frightened, but I'm less frightened. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because nice the, be. looking at the discussion, that the ensuing discussion, you know, it, it's clear that we have a lot to sort out, but it's also clear that we can do something about them if we are systematic and comprehensive in our approaches. So uh, it's, it's clear that that can happen. You know, the fear is still there, but I'm, I'm less fearful. <laughs> well, you're <laughs> smiling, so that... that... I, I'm not alone. Um, there's so many comparativists that are here today, you know, that I realize I'm not alone. And everybody sort of, even though they have different thoughts, the, the baseline remains the same. Exactly. And we, we know that, um, comparative education will be there forever, you know? So it, it, it's good that we can position it in its rightful place, so to speak, and continue to work at the issues and challenges. Thank you, Gertrude. So, well, I have produced a fully written version of this presentation, this keynote, and um, I'll give James the follow, follow up uh, sort of polished version um, later today. Um, but um, I'm hoping that that might be um, helpful for anybody sort of wanting to sort of just rethink things in, in, in another time, you know, when you've yeah, got quite more helpful. space I'd be happy to, to have think that. about that. So look out for that and I hope it might yes. be accessible and helpful. Yes, I, yes, I'd be quite happy. Thank you so much. Good. Yeah, I've just noticed in the chat that some of our, my friends and colleagues working at the University of the South Pacific have just signed out and, and said that, you know, they enjoyed the session, but they have to go now. Um, but the, the significant thing in that is, it's something like when we began, it was something like three or four o'clock in the morning. So they were getting out of bed at some awful time to try to join us. So I think they did well for the last 40 minutes or whatever they did. I wanna just share with everyone the historical significance of this. Um, we started, um, I think, after the World Council of uh, or World Congress of um, Comparative Education in Beijing, and uh, it started small, um, but uh, we had a, a very interesting world forum that was in conjunction with the Norwegian. Comparative Education Society. And we wanted to just um, test the waters of doing two or three different things. One is we wanted to test the waters on how we did um, keynotes um, uh, in the form of uh, a debate. So um, in the first World Forum, we had Mark Bray and Larry Souter actually try to rehash the Potter and Kuhn debate on research quality. And then we had a number of other um, 
notable scholars actually give talks, and now we have Michael Crosley. Um, what has eventuated in terms of the technology is that we've been able to uh, meet um, via Zoom around the world. And um, as Michael, you pointed out, um, it's now 3.53 a.m. in the morning in Australia. <laughs> um, and so it's generally speaking in the smaller states of the Pacific Islands, it's, it's probably around 1, 1.50 in the morning. So uh, I'm really pleased to see that they actually attended. But the best part of all of this is James, um, you have gone uh, out of your way to help us um, produce a quality uh, format to allow individual educators from different walks of life to be able to speak. And uh, as a result, we're getting a whole cadre of people from around the world. And um, I can't thank you enough for actually doing this. But I also wanna thank David Turner uh, for um, making this actually possible because he believed very strongly in this type of venue. But Michael, I wanted to say this was an exceptional keynote speech. I really wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart because what you did was you humanized uh, the educational experience and you brought in a whole host of different people, different perspectives and I just wanted to thank you for that. So this is to say thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I hope that we continue this and um, thank you for all for attending. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian.